guys! My name is Kizaya and I'm happy to be able to bring the message to you this week as we continue to talk about families. So one day back in middle school, I was walking home with my friend. It was a short walk and we lived in the same neighborhood. And we decided to go to her house first. When we got there, her mom was waiting for her at the doorstep and when she saw my friend, a huge smile appeared on her face. As my friend and I walked up closer to the doorstep, her mom was like, Welcome home, sweet pea. How was school? My friend and her mom gave each other a big hug. I was surprised because it was completely different from how I interact with my mom or my dad or anyone in my family for that matter. Like, a parent and a kid were actually close and fully expressed their love to one another. That was new to me. As kids, we tend to see our parents as superheroes or our families as being great or at least being normal. But then something happens and it changes everything. It's the moment when we realize our family isn't perfect. Or maybe we realize that other people might say something is off or different about our family. You, might, you may have heard the phrase, blood is thicker than water, and it might cause us to ask the question, if family is, act is thicker than water, shouldn't I just ignore what might be wrong? Some of you may have started asking questions about your family a long time ago. In fact, some of your earliest memories might have to do with pain because of your family. Others of you discovered this later. Maybe it was in middle school or early in your high school years when you realized that your family picture wasn't as perfect as you might have thought. As I got older, I got really close with one of my cousins. After moving here to Camarillo, she would tell me about what went on between our family back in San Diego. And some of the things I heard were pretty shocking. I totally thought everyone in our family was a great person, but the drama and secrets I learned about told me otherwise. I didn't know what to feel about my family anymore. Every one of us could probably go around and tell our version of a less than picture perfect family story. We all have one. Because in one way or another, every family has its challenges. Maybe your family lives with constant tension. You don't slam doors and yell, but you constantly feel the anxiety. You feel it when your parents talk about money or their jobs. You feel it around your brother or your stepsister. You feel it when certain subjects co come up that shouldn't cause conflict, but somehow they do. And it makes your house feel like a pretty stressful face place to live. For some of you, maybe you've discovered that your family lives with secrets. You never really saw it when you were younger, but now you know. Maybe you've discovered some things that you, never, that you wish you never did about a relationship, a legal problem, or a bad decision. And now because of those secrets, you wonder if you can fully trust your family. And for a lot of you, your family has, an, an, has experienced an earthquake event of some sort that left everyone with some wounds. Something that has shaken things up and suddenly it feels like things won't ever be the same again. Maybe it was a divorce or a death in the family. You thought once you got through the drama, things would be fine, but they're not. There's no going back to normal with your family. And now you wonder if family relationships are really worth the effort when they can possibly just go away. Regardless of your family story, it's important to remember that every family is imperfect. There is no pain like family pain. I think all of us should know deep down that family should be better. It should be happier and more forgiving. In our minds, most of us have an ideal family. It's the one we wish we had, but we don't have an ideal family. We have a real family. And the distance between our ideal family and our real family can cause a lot of pain. And that's typically when we respond one of two ways. We either count our family out or we count ourselves out. And because of that, we like to think that the tension secrets and wounds are written in permanent marker while you and your family are written in dry erase. Easy to be counted out. Pretend this is dry erase. <laughs> Maybe you count your family out because after your parents divorced, you thought they lost authority in your life, so you stopped respecting them. Or you decided that your stepmom isn't a good role model, so you're not gonna listen to her. Or you decided to shut out one of your siblings because of something they did. Whatever the reason, we use our family members' mistakes as a reason or excuse to not listen to them or not include them in our lives. 
We say things like, I don't have to listen or be in a relationship with you because of what you did or didn't do. Or we count ourselves out. Maybe we don't say it out loud, but we give up on our families. We isolate ourselves. We stay in our rooms when we're home. We think, I'm done with my parent not showing up. I'm done with my parent nagging me. My family feels like a bunch of hypocrites, so I'm done. I'm going to count down the days until I'm out of here and never have to come back. All of us have probably felt the pull of wanting to pull away from our family. And we know it's probably not the best idea, but what's the alternative? What else are we supposed to do? Shouldn't our parents be the one trying to fake this and not us? What if I told you that there's one idea you may have never considered that could change the way you see your family forever? That's what we're going to talk about today. Here's the good news. God has a long history of working with imperfect, changing, different, or dysfunctional families. There are a lot of them being recorded in the Bible. And God has never written off anybody because of the family they came from. One of the most famous people in the Bible is a man named Abraham. God promised Abraham that his family would form a great nation, and eventually a savior named Jesus would come from that family line. But before a great nation was formed, Abraham had to have, had to have one kid. He had a son named Isaac, and then Isaac, along with his wife Rebecca, eventually had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And so the family drama began. Jacob and Esau couldn't have been any more different. Esau was the older brother. He was a hunter and a warrior, a man of action. Jacob, on the other hand, was more of an artist. He was a thinker and a poet. He was also a bit of a liar and a con artist. And so the stage was set for some good old family tension. As the oldest brother, Esau was guaranteed, guaranteed to inherit a birthright. According to the customs of the time, he would receive a spe special privileges that other children wouldn't get. He would receive double the amount of money. He would become the leader of the entire family tribe when, he, when his dad passed away. And maybe the biggest deal of all, he would get a blessing from his father, which also meant that he'd be blessed by God. So needless to say, birthrights were a big deal. One day, Esau was out hunting. And when he arrived home, he was hungry. It's that moment when you're ready to crush an entire large piece pizza by yourself. He comes home and smells Jacob's cooking. He asked his little bro for a bowl of stew. And that's when things go sideways. Check out the account in Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25, verse 27 through 34. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me ha have some of that red stew, I'm famished. This is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. This is classic older sibling, younger sibling drama. The Bible describes the riv rivalry in ancient times, but most of us have seen a modern version of this played out in some way. Yes, family drama has always been a thing. Fast forward to when Isaac was dying. Jacob did in fact get the birthright blessing that was meant for Esau. In response, Esau was so bitter and angry that he decided his only course of action would be to kill Jacob. When Jacob learned this, he ran away from home with no plans to come back. This is family drama at the next level. Despite all of that, don't miss this. Jesus came from this family. God knew their mess and saw how imperfect they were, but he didn't run away from them. He used them anyway. Not only did God use this family, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament records the story of Jacob and Esau thousands of years later as a celebration of faith. Their story is a part of the lineage of people and families God used to show us what his kingdom is like. Here's what Hebrews 11 says. Hebrews 11 verse 20. 
By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. Here's what's amazing about this. The writer of Hebrews obviously isn't celebrating the chaos of this family. They aren't being held up as a model to follow, full of lying, deceit, and threats of violence. They aren't mentioned as people who give us a model to copy. They are mentioned to draw attention to who God is. A God who can take on any challenge, messiness, hurt, or dysfunction from any family and bring good out of it. Here's the thing. Whether it's your family or a family you know, there's no family story that can't be rewritten. There's no family situation that God can't ultimately use for good and credible purposes. From God's perspective, there's no family you can count out, and there's no person in a family you can count out. God is never done. The story of Jacob and Esau tells us that even in our worst family moments, our family story isn't over. God's love for you and everyone in your family is thicker than water. To God, you are not like family. You are family. Even though we can't see it right now, we can trust that God has a plan. My guess is that if you would have asked Jacob and Esau in the moment if God was doing something good, they both would have said no. They never would have imagined that thousands of years later, God would have turned their family story into a story for the ages. For some of us in the room, as difficult as it is to believe, it would be a game changer to know that God isn't done with your family. It doesn't mean things will never be difficult. It doesn't mean things will ever become perfect. But knowing that God can redeem even the most challenging family situations helps change your perspective. You never know what God has in store for you, your parents, your step-parents, your siblings, or your entire family. In fact, believing that God can use in a perfect family could be one of your greatest acts of faith. It starts by knowing this. Your family story isn't finished. Family is thicker than water even when things get murky. Family is thicker than water even when the tides get tough. Family is thicker than water even when things aren't picture perfect. Everyone who lives at your house is an imperfect person. But when they mess up, don't write them off and treat them like that's the end of their story. Because God is always working, even when it doesn't look like it is. So don't count them out. So when your stepdad never shows up, don't write him off forever. When your mom loses her temper, don't write her off forever. When you and your cousins have a big disagreement, don't write them off forever. And don't count yourself out. You don't know what's gonna happen next. When the chaos in your family feels like too much, don't isolate. When the arguing feels constant, don't run away. When you're aggravated or annoyed, challenge yourself to hang in there, to keep talking, to act like the people in the room matter to you, because you know they do. Now, if you need to step away to keep yourself safe, do it. I'm not saying to stay in a, in a dangerous relationship that's hurting you physically or mentally. There are times you'll need to take a breather or some time away. In those times, make time to talk to a trusted adult. It might be your pastor or your small group leader or someone at, on staff at your school. Here's what I'm getting at. There's a big difference between dangerous and annoying. So don't count yourself out because if you count yourself out, you may miss out on being part of an incredible story that God is writing in your family. Redeeming and fixing things that we want to label broken is what God does best. God takes chaos and uses it for good. Because even though a broken family is never God's plan, taking broken things and pulling good out of them is what God specializes in. So take heart and have faith in what God can do. Remember, God hasn't given up on your family, so you don't have to either. I'll pray us out. Dear God, I just thank you that um, everybody is here to watch or listen to this message. I just pray that everyone remembers that their family story isn't finished and that you can still make good out of the bad. We love you so much and we just thank you for every single day. In your name we pray, amen.